Before we jump into today's video, we got to give you a little reminder in case you forgot. Our snacks, awesome snacks that bussin from heaven above with jerky, licorice, and nuts. Our snacks are awesome snacks. Now turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, scoop me up something to munch on. At rrgsnacks.com. Our online concession stand that has an assortment of beef and bacon jerky, gummy sour bears, and blue raspberry licorice for you to enjoy while watching our videos. Or in church, girl. <laughs> you gotta have church candy at church. Everybody got church candy. <laughs> we wanted to ask you about Bishop Eddie Long. Oh. Oh, no comment. Come on. Can we just talk to you for a second? Eddie Lee Long was born on May 12, 1953. A damn Taurus. I knew it. I knew it. He was raised in Charlotte, North Carolina by his parents, Reverend Floyd M. Long and Hattie Long. After graduating from North Carolina Central University, where he received his bachelor's degree in business administration, he worked as a sales rep for Ford Motor Company. According to the New York Times, he was fired over inaccuracies that were listed on his expense accounts. Even in scheming. <laughs> He moved to Atlanta to study theology and became the pastor of a small church. In 1981, he married a woman named Debara Houston. According to court docs obtained by several media outlets, she accused him of cruel treatment and was afraid of his violent and vicious temper. He allegedly put his hands on her during their marriage, including when she was seven and a half months pregnant with their son, Edward. After a few years of marriage, they separated and Eddie filed for divorce. Their divorce was finalized in 1985, and she was awarded custody of their son, while Eddie received visitation rights every other weekend. In 1987, he became the senior pastor at New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. Three years later, he married a woman named Vanessa, and they went on to have three children. New Birth sits on a massive 240-acre complex just outside of Atlanta. As the head of the church, Bishop Long was known for his blend of social conservatism, materialistic worship, and anti-gay rhetoric. His sermons became televised in over 170 countries, and he routinely met with celebrities and political leaders. Just like Bishop T.D. Jakes, whom we covered in a previous video, Bishop Long preached the prosperity gospel, also called Name It and Claim It, a style of preaching that states the power of the Holy Spirit can be put to use for whatever the believer wants and that God blesses those he favors with material wealth and health. His message that God wants people to prosper attracted celebrities, professional athletes, and socialites. According to the New York Times, people affectionately called the church Club New Birth because it attracted so many young black singles who were looking to hook up. <laughs> Oop, I mean, looking to link up and go to Bible study together. Turn to 1 Corinthians and open them legs. <laughs> <laughs> Bishop Long built a religious and financial empire from scratch, and the church went on to include a multi-million dollar network of charities and businesses, a private school, and a health and fitness center where he would work out with young men in his congregation. Y'all remember them selfies with them tight ass shirts he be wearing, nipples just all out in the pool pit. They used to get on my damn nerves so bad. <laughs> he drove a $350,000 Bentley, and in 2005, he bought a $1.1 million dollar home for his family. He was frequently seen in gold necklaces, Rolex watches, and spandex shirts to show off his bulging muscles. <laughs> See, I told you, tig old bitties. <laughs> With the increased attention on his church, the media began looking more closely at his finances. A writer for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution discovered the bishop received up to $3 million from the church and its charities over a three-year time period. When asked about the payments, the bishop defiantly responded, We're not just a church. We're an international corporation. I pastor a multi-million dollar congregation. Okay, bishop. <laughs> Chill out now. 
By 1999, his Atlanta megachurch had reached 25,000 members. He had been invited to the White House and built a global television ministry. He believed it was his special calling to reach out to men. And he wrote several books, including one called Gladiator, The Strength of a Man, that teaches men how to be warriors for God. But apparently, there was something weighing heavy on the bishop. CNN reported that when a visitor was invited to write about the pressures of being a high-profile pastor, Bishop Long responded, You don't want any of this. You don't want any of this. Any of uh, what, Bishop? The hell he talking about? To his congregation, he could do no wrong. But others began to notice the problematic side of the bishop. It's unsurprising that he leaned on the Bible as to why he denounced homosexuality. However, Bishop Long was loud and bold in his condemnation of the LGBTQ community. My grandmama used to say a hit dog a holler every time. He created a ministry to help deliver people from homosexuality. And in 2004, he led the Reigniting the Legacy March alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s daughter, Reverend Bernice King, who was an elder at New Birth Church. The main goal of the march was to promote a constitutional amendment to protect marriage between one man and one woman. The bishop also called for a national ban on gay marriage. The march began after Dr. King's daughter lit a torch at her father's grave and passed it on to Bishop Long, who carried it on the two-mile march through the city. Dr. King said, now why am I in it? Now, you're probably wondering why they chose to meet at Dr. King's gravesite. Well, this is where things get complicated. For decades, conservatives have attempted to sanitize Dr. King's legacy in order to fit right-wing agendas. Look, I think when you get to a point, for example, where one school uh, in Washington State wanted to have a day where no whites were allowed on campus. That's the opposite of Dr. King. One of the first leaders to invoke Dr. King's message in support of conservative ideas was former U.S. President Ronald Reagan. According to CNN, Reagan cited Dr. King's content of our character line from his I Have a Dream speech to argue that affirmative action and racial hiring quotas aren't needed in Dr. King's vision of a colorblind society. Ain't nobody ass Ronald Reagan nothing. Quote somebody white. Quote somebody white, Ronald. Conservatives have also argued that Dr. King believed in a fixed moral law traditional values and traditional families based on misconstrued excerpts from Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail. However, Dr. King never rebuked homosexuality, and his widow, Coretta Scott King, publicly denounced homophobia. <laughs> Boom. So, to sum things up, a writer for NPR stated that Bishop Long's decision to begin his anti-gay march at Dr. King's gravesite was nothing more than a right-wing misappropriation of Dr. King's legacy in an attempt to deepen political wedges between black people and the LGBTQ community. The Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups, called Bishop Long one of the most virulently homophobic black leaders in the religiously-based anti-gay movement. The center also quoted one of Bishop Long's sermons called Back to the Future. The sermon goes a little something like this. <clears throat> Take your time. Take your time. It's the most unattractive thing I have ever seen. When I see women wearing uniforms that men would wear and women fighting to get in the military. Hallelujah. The woman gets perverted to turn towards woman. Yeah. And everybody knows it's dangerous to enter and exit. God says you deserve death. Damn. In his book, I Don't Want Delilah, I Need You, Bishop Long even blamed some women for turning men into homosexuals. I know you lie. Now how we catch a stray? One year, Bishop Long extended an invitation to gays and lesbians looking for a cure to attend a conference at his church to help deliver them from their unwanted desires. Did he go? <laughs> he probably need to sign up himself. You need to be the first one at the registration table. When Coretta Scott King passed away in 2006, her memorial service was held at Bishop Long's church. I know she didn't agree to that sh Because of Bishop Long's teachings, several people refused to attend the service. Those who supported him continued focusing on his positive attributes. He gave cars and money to strangers at church services. He built ministries to help the poor, AIDS patients, and young people. And he talked proudly about being young men's spiritual daddy. Oh, here we go. I think you meant zaddy. 
own zaddy. He even paid some men's college tuition, including Pastor Jamal Bryant. Wait, hold up now. <laughs> I told you. Zaddy. <laughs> I told you. After his parents returned to Georgia after serving as AME missionaries in Africa, Pastor Bryant claimed his parents didn't have enough money to pay for his education. Bishop Long came to the rescue to help them out. Pastor Bryant announced during a church sermon, I am eternally grateful for him making that deposit and that impact in my life. Deposit? With absolutely no fanfare, he never announced it from his pulpit, over a microphone, even to this day. Bishop Long purchased business suits for young men, played basketball with them, and lifted weights with them. He once told the AJC that mothers at his church even trusted him enough to bring their badass teenage boys to him for some paddling. Paddling? Huh? Wait a minute now. Why didn't them mamas just whoop their asses at the house? That don't seem strange to y'all. This don't feel right. Bishop Long said, when I say bend over, even on Sunday, they bend over. It, Jesus. The bishop stepped up to be a father figure to black boys who were lacking that parental figure. But did he have ulterior motives? You betcha. Allegedly. As he continued being laser focused on the LGBTQ community, critics wondered why he was so stuck on that agenda. Why wasn't the bishop addressing other things in the black community, such as racism, colorism, and gang violence? Why the hell did he see homosexuality as such a threat to black Americans? Well, it all boiled down to Bishop Long's penchant for parroting right-wing propaganda. Here we go again. Here we go. Bishop Long and other black pastors appear to take cues from conservative media outlets and conservative Christian organizations. For example, the late Lewis Sheldon, who was the chairman of the Traditional Values Coalition, said on Tucker Carlson's show in 2006 and called homosexuality the biggest problem facing inner city black neighborhoods. Why you say that, Lewis? You ain't got nothing else to talk about, Lewis? But should anti-gay pastors take all the blame? Absolutely not. Bishop Long was preaching to a segment of the black population who agreed with every word that came out of his mouth. On one hand, black Americans are more likely to support anti-discrimination legislation. However, they are more likely than any other group to disapprove of homosexuality. And why is this? Well, it all boils down to the deep level of religious conviction that has been passed down from generation to generation in black families. According to recent studies, black Americans have the highest religious engagement of any group of Americans, and nearly half of all black Americans say they attend church at least weekly. And yep, that's where they are more likely to hear anti-gay sermons. Absolutely fed up with black preachers who had it out for the LGBTQ community, activists Keith Boykin and Jasmine Kanick kicked off a five-part series called Outing Black Pastors. Lord, this is getting messy. In the series, Keith and Jasmine wondered if Bishop T.D. Jakes, Bishop Eddie Long, and other black pastors were constantly condemning gay people because they themselves were struggling with their own sexual orientation. Keith and Jasmine started soliciting information about the pastor's private lives in order to prove their theory. They were able to collect uncorroborated tips, but were unable to obtain any solid information to confirm if the bishops were gay. But apparently, they were on to something. Allegedly. In 2009, Bishop Long was done with the negative images he was witnessing on TV and film. So he partnered with Robert Townsend to form Bell Town Productions. Their plan was to produce films, TV shows, and mobile content that was uplifting and positive. But before they could get the ball really going, God said, Bishop Long, you got some explaining to do. I cannot get the sound of his voice out of my head. And I cannot forget the smell of his cologne. And I cannot forget the way that he made me cry many nights when I drove in his cars on the way home, not able to take enough showers to wipe the smell of him off of my body. In September 2010, four men claimed the bishop used his position as their spiritual daddy to coerce them into sexual relationships. I was 14 when I moved to Atlanta. Take my number down. Call me. Me, I'm 14 years old. I'm new to the state. You're... I can't. Like, what do we got to talk about? When I got in trouble at school, I called him, and the next day, the t teacher was actually saying, can I keep my job? I apologize. 
And that's how I actually got caught up into it. Let me just do everything the church do. Let me do everything he say do because I want to be like that. You got that much power. The men stated Bishop Long used a private spiritual ceremony to mark a covenant between them. One of the men said the bishop would even cite scripture to justify their relationship. The men claimed they were teenagers when they joined the bishop's church. When the alleged incident started, three of them were older than 18 and one said he was 17. They alleged that the bishop encouraged them to join the church's elite youth group so he could groom them for intimate acts in exchange for money, new cars, housing and exotic trips, jewelry and electronics. Bishop Long was accused of taking them on overnight trips where they shared a bedroom and engaged in intimate acts. What trapped us was, you know, we were just addicted to the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we was addicted to the love that we got because I, I, I didn't have a dad my whole life. I, 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 was, I, was, I was fatherless and to have a man love me just for who I was, I just had to be me. I just had to, to love him back. And the gifts kept pouring in as long as they continued to follow their master. Now, the parents didn't think this was strange that these little boys was coming home with all this money and gifts and cars. One of the men told CBS News that the pastor wanted intimate acts performed at his house, in hotels, in condos, and in the church before and after service. The bishop also sent him suggestive photos of himself in spandex workout clothes and expected to receive pictures in return. One of the men stated that when some of them found girlfriends, the bishop would attempt to block those relationships by increased contact and spiritual talk about the covenant between the spiritual son and himself. So yeah, the married pastor who preached so passionately against homosexuality was allegedly on the down low the entire time. Did he have so many terrible things to say about the LGBTQ community because he was battling his own demons? Some people completely wrote him off for allegedly taking advantage of young black boys who were seeking love and guidance from a father figure. But since his church was independent, he didn't have to answer to anyone. However, a writer for CNN encouraged him to sit himself down, which is a term used in the Christian church that means he needed to stop his ministerial duties to protect the integrity of the word of God. Sit your ass down. Instead of sitting himself down, he addressed his congregation a few days after the allegations were made public. He said he would continue leading the church and would fight the allegations. He also turned to biblical terms to portray himself as an underdog. He said, I feel like David against Goliath, but I got five rocks and I haven't thrown one yet. Stop lying. Amen, Pastor. Sit your ass down. Hallelujah. God is good. Stop lying. Sit your ass down. A fifth accuser later came forward and revealed he had the bishop's name tattooed on his wrists along with the words, never a mistake, always a lesson. He was included in the case when the bishop settled the lawsuit in May 2011 for an undisclosed amount. Since it was a civil case, he didn't have to admit guilt. So why did you settle the case? The, the, the old gambler song, got no when to hold it, no when to fold it, no when to walk away. So I had to make a decision to save me, save my family, and save the church. Bishop Long went from declaring he would fight the allegations to throwing in the towel. And still, his supporters continued to think highly of him, and they turned a blind eye to the allegations. A woman named Camelia Henson told the AJC that the settlement hadn't shaken her faith, she added, it doesn't make me think he's guilty or anything. I decided when this came out that I loved my pastor unconditionally. This is what's wrong with the black church. Hold these mofos accountable. Hell. His wife Vanessa stood by his side the entire time, up until December 2011 when she filed for divorce. Bye, Ashy. As much as I love my husband, I couldn't take another minute pretending that I was okay. After the divorce filing, the bishop announced he was taking leave from the church. But the same day his wife filed, she changed her mind and decided to withdraw her petition. Damn, girl, you was on the right track. With the case behind them, the bishop had some time to reflect. We took one for the team and read his final memoir, which we've linked in our description box. Thank you, girl, because I don't think I could have got through that. In his book, he admits that he got caught up in the trappings of being a celebrity. Famous people wanted to be in his presence, and vice versa. It fed his ego, and slowly, the attention was more on him than it was on Jesus. 
After the allegations were made public, none of his celebrity friends wanted to be seen with him. The only person who checked up on him immediately after the scandal was Deion Sanders. Deion jumped on a flight straight to Atlanta just to tell the bishop face to face, I'm here if you need me. His calendar went from being completely full to completely empty. He wondered if it was worth it to keep living. What kept me is that every time I showed up here, you were here. He went to counseling to deal with what he called the emotional trauma. He credited his wife for putting her emotional needs on hold to keep their marriage and their family intact. The curse of a black woman, honey. Mm, mm, mm. We always sacrifice. He had to uproot his family because the media circus in front of their home was too much. And he expressed regret for ruining his daughter's senior year of high school. Ninja, you just fucked up everything, huh? By February 2012, he had been hit with more lawsuits and was the subject of a Senate investigation concerning whether he personally profited from his church's tax-exempt status. In court transcripts, Long, under oath, has said, basically, Bishop Eddie Long Ministries is Bishop Eddie Long, and that his tax-exempt nonprofit bought him this house on Hunt Valley Drive. The assets of that charity have to go to a charitable purpose or at the end of the life of that charity have to go to another charity. Records began to show that the bishop's assets had been intertwined with the church's assets for years, including the church paying $200,000 in property taxes for his private residence and $85,000 for a plane. In February 2014, 13 former members of his church filed a lawsuit against him. Lord, this keeps getting messier. In their lawsuit, they claim the bishop introduced them to a man named Efren Taylor, who the bishop described as his friend and brother during a financial seminar in October 2009. Now, Efren just sound like a name that's a scammer, don't it? <laughs> but let's see what they say. Efren managed to convince members of the church to invest nearly a million dollars into ventures that were essentially non-existent. <laughs> See, I told you. It was a small piece of a gigantic financial scheme that you can learn more about in the link in our description box. Although the bishop wasn't involved in Efren's Ponzi scheme, he still settled with his former church members for $1 million. As for Efren, well, he was sentenced to 19 years behind bars for victimizing over 400 people across the U.S. Bye, Ashy. The bishop popped back up at his church in July 2016. His bulging muscles had deflated and he looked frail. A blog reported he had been admitted to the hospital in Atlanta and had only been given months to live. The blogger claimed a member of the bishop's congregation revealed that he was suffering from stage four gastrointestinal cancer. The bishop shared a video of himself in the gym and said he was on a new diet. I said to my congregation, I'm going to live to be 100 years old, maybe add a few more years. But you know what? I wasn't going to get there stopping by Popeyes. In August 2016, he admitted he was recovering from a health challenge, but he believed God would deliver him from his ailment. Kim Burrell, with her messy self, stated the bishop's illness was a result of his choices. Five months later, Bishop Long passed away at the age of 63. His church confirmed that cancer was the cause of his passing. At his service, his son Edward, who was a minister at New Birth at the time, acknowledged that he knew not everyone was there to mourn. He knew a lot of people showed up just to make sure Bishop Long was really in the casket. Edward also extended forgiveness to the people who spoke against his father. Despite transitioning, the IRS wasn't done with the Longs. In July 2017, they were hit with a tax bill totaling a little over $300,000. And what happened to New Birth after the bishop passed away? Well, the church was in shambles. Debts totaled about $30 million, and membership dropped from 25,000 parishioners to about 8,000. Bye, Ashley. The church was built heavily around its charismatic leader, and it's kind of hard to teach about the prosperity gospel and the belief that God rewards the faithful with wealth and health when the bishop's health failed him in his final years. Bishop Stephen A. Davis, who called Bishop Long his spiritual father, was announced as the church's new pastor. But after just 16 months on the job, Bishop Davis resigned and revealed he left the congregation because of the politics of corrupt leaders he described as fools. Oh, Lord, here we go. Here we go. In a cryptic announcement during a Facebook Live broadcast, Bishop Davis explained how he worked for free the entire time he led the church after Bishop Long's death. 
for free? Where they do that at? He also stated he paid for his own housing and even gave the Long family $3,500 a month to pay for one of the bishop's condos. He also said he gave the Long family $85,000, all while still giving the church tithes every month. Oh, he got money. Is he single girl? I can be his first lady. <laughs> okay, I look good in hats. In November 2018, it was announced that Pastor Jamal Bryant was replacing Bishop Davis. When Pastor Bryant opened the doors of the church to new and returning members in December 2018, he announced they could use Cash App and credit card swipers to make offerings. How about I offer you my foot up your ass? How about that? Take the sweaty ass one dollar bill and get your ass on. Following the news that Pastor Bryant would be taking over, Bishop Long's son Edward took to the pulpit at New Birth and revealed the pain of being repeatedly overlooked as his father's successor. According to Christian Post website, Edward said that everyone expected him to fill the role that his dad left vacant. However, church leaders kept going in a different direction. They don't want no more Longs in the pulpit, okay? You a long way off from ever being in that pulpit, okay? <laughs> Blame your daddy. He fucked it up for everybody. Sure did. As of this video, we can confirm that Edward is no longer with New Birth Church. Following his passing, people continue to mock Bishop Long's life and death, but not everyone chooses to focus on the scandalous aspects of his life. A writer for Huff Post wrote, As for me, Bishop Long will always be remembered as the gifted, charismatic, and complex preacher who did a lot of good and built a mega influential ministry, but tragically ended up getting drunk off the wine of his own power and influence. And in 2022, Usher revealed he attended New Birth as a child. Lord, he got Usher too? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Not Usher. Usher said Bishop Long would always say, watch this, watch this, during his sermons. Now watch this. I got to read this. I got to read this. Now watch this. Please hear this. Please hear this. Watch this. Watch this. Hmm. Usher then thanked the bishop for inspiring him to say the words, watch this, on his hit song, Confessions Part 2. Well, damn. Now I can't listen to Confessions no more. Damn. Based on his final memoir, Bishop Long made right with God before his passing, but some people are still torn on how to grieve the passing of someone who was so problematic. A writer at Unfit Christian said it best, We should still choose grace, and in no way, shape, or form does grace mean a denial of truth. I simply choose to accept that Bishop Long was complex, flawed, and human. Because of that, it is okay that we express a range of emotions towards his legacy. If you enjoyed this video, let us know down below. And thanks for watching. Ah, uh, ah, uh, gee.